England is definitely one of the best nations in EU4 for a sort of intermediate player to learn how to move into advanced techniques. England can be played by players of any level and accomplish great things at any skill level. Oftentimes guides are made with either no particular skill level in mind or a beginner level. Other non-guide content will be catered towards your hardcore gamers. This guide is oriented towards late beginners and early intermediate level players, but not total hardcore nerds, and not fresh players who haven't played before either. Sometimes it can be easy to be blinded by the mission trees, or to just focus on your set of three rivals. It can be easy to speed 5 past all the opportunity you have to really dominate in the game, and I'd like to look specifically at England with some lessons that particularly apply to them, alongside lessons that will apply to every nation you play. Let's jump into England here in patch 1.35.6, and try to really go above and beyond, but not too, too hardcore to achieve a powerful nation with no true rivals. It can feel natural that England has to decide between her insular and her continental interests, but this is not the case for any nation that might seem like it has a binary choice to make. In England's case, it's especially true that you have no reason to believe that you have to take the Angevin Empire path to rule over France, given that no matter what choices you make, you could end up at war with France with a personal union war. That being said, defeating France earlier can seem difficult. Luckily, we have some allies to exploit and things to get done while our allies work on it. First of all, we'll be more or less abandoning the continent until we're ready. For that reason, we'll be deleting all of our forts in Normandy, Gascony, and Calais. The ease with which land is taken also applies to how it is retaken, so we'll just let France occupy it and then come back for it later. Before any of that though, let's take a look at Estates and Parliament. For Parliament, I actually recommend getting the support the war effort issue because we'll be taking on some war exhaustion from everything France is occupying, and keeping that down will be useful. Definitely do the parliament issue before assigning new seats, so you can pay fewer bribes, and then let's look at estates. I am, rather famously, very conservative with my estates. I like to have lots of crown land, and I don't like to drop below 20% when I can, unless I'm speedrunning, or I desperately need money. Feel free to use your own experience to determine how best to do your estates. The reason I recommend running in England's estates conservatively is firstly that we will want to get rid of the villainage privilege, and we're going to be pretty much constantly at war for the first chunk of the game here. That slow creep of autonomy will add up pretty quickly from being below 20% crown land. I really value administrative points, so I took the admin point privilege, but you could also sway me for the military point privilege since you want to get ahead of France quickly, but again, to each their own. Next up are mercenaries, which I always look for siege pips in. You might think you'd want a combat-oriented mercenary stack, but honestly, a ton of your losses in war, if you're taking smart battles, will come from attrition during sieges. Mercenaries are super good for this since their manpower pool is separate from your nation's manpower. I got unlucky and didn't get any crazy siege trip companies, but the red shanks at least have a shock damage modifier and some decent pips, so I'm getting them. Get them near Scotland, since we'll be fighting Scotland very soon, and then let's look at alliances. England's allies are very important for defeating France in this drawn-out war. On our own, France and its vassals will wipe the floor with our nation. I find it pretty much necessary to ally both Burgundy and Castile in order to win the Hundred Years' War. The two nations, although powerful, actually will most likely not be able to take down the behemoth of France. They don't have to. They just need to drain their manpower. Anyway, alliance off to Burgundy, unpause, alliance to Castile, and let's get to work. When you hire that mercenary company, you should complete the mission that gives you a subjugation CB on Scotland, and you'll certainly have a deficit. We can maintain a deficit for quite a while while using those burger loans and selling crown land as necessary, so don't worry about it. We'll fix up an economy later on. We're going to wait until Surrender of Maine event pops up, and once it does, you will refuse to give Maine back. In like 95% of cases, France will force you to declare war on them with that decision, and this is where our allies come in. We don't have the favors to call them in, but we can promise them land. They won't be getting any though. Before calling in the allies, I'm going to let France chill for a little while. I'm hoping they might load up troops on some ships and try to get into England so I can destroy the ships, but it never happened. You could try to make it happen if you want, or you can just call on your allies immediately. I was just curious to test if it could happen. By the way, declare war on Scotland for subjugation, and I made Brittany alongside any Irish nations co-belligerents just because I may as well conquer them too, although Brittany is certainly ambitious. Your war with Scotland should be relatively easy, although Scotland has a larger army than you might expect. You're best off hoping they get into Ireland and end up stuck behind the straight crossing, which is exactly what happened in my game. If you can't get that to happen, you'll only want to fight Scotland with overwhelming numbers to avoid taking losses. One thing I really like doing is sending in the mercenary company first to take the brunt of the losses, then reinforcing with regular soldiers to push the battle into victory. That way you lose your mercenary manpower, which is a much better resource to sacrifice than your own manpower. In my case though, with Scotland trapped in Ireland, I split my troops and sieged all of their land quite easily. Done in France, Burgundy is getting occupied and France is holding their own against Castile and Burgundy because they're not at all overpowered. This is good because France is wasting manpower and money fighting my allies who have been promised land that I don't want to give them anyway. The best case scenario is if France eats a little bit out of Burgundy or Castile so that when I put them in a union, I can get even more land, but I'll be happy to see France making a white peace with them too. Once I finished sieging Edinburgh and the Isles, I marched into Tyrone and got ready to destroy Scotland's army. 
I did the mercenary army first technique to keep casualties low, but even with that, I took some heavy losses and killing Scotland's army was pretty unnecessary. I just wanted to siege down the Irish nation there. After one more fight, I got a stack wipe, and thus, Scotland is completely defeated. The next hurdle was the War of the Roses, which sounds like a hurdle, but it's actually a good thing because of the immense prestige and stability. Take whichever monarch has better stats, which in my case, both had awful stats, and then just crush the pretenders as soon as possible. If you're lucky, they'll rise up in your continental holdings and France will kill them for you. It was at this point that Burgundy made peace, leaving Castile left to fight, but look at France's manpower pool. 19k troops, zero manpower. I currently have the advantage on France, although their vassals will tip the scales in their favor. Hopefully Castile can hit them a little bit more and get that troop count even lower. With a couple more pretenders dead, the War of the Roses has ended, and now I've got a ton of prestige, which means more morale for fighting France, and extra stability. I'm at minus 2, but I want more, so I'm going to dump some points into my stability. I went up to 0, then took the event for plus 1, this was followed up by the Tudor Dynasty event for an OK heir and another stability, and finally the mission for the War of the Roses, which gives yet another stability. I am now at plus 3 stability, with 65 prestige, and I even get an aggressive expansion reduction from the House Unified modifier, which is good because both Scotland and France's subjugation will incur heavy aggressive expansion. I went and landed troops in Brittany so I could piece them up by just blockading and sitting on their capital, which was a bit scary as France's army came upon me rather quickly. I managed to sneak away a 1k France stack, then won a battle in Brittany, which put the French army into retreat. This left all those vassal armies free to be wiped from this earth. In wars like this, when you see small stacks, you've got to take the battles and destroy them because the losses they take are way larger than your losses. This is the attrition warfare strategy of defeating France. Especially because we have mercenaries, we can throw men away, whereas France is not willing to hire mercenaries due to the AI not understanding their value. I wiped another 7,000 French troops that went for a big battle in Caen, being sure to shift consolidate my army before going in. That battle was honestly a bit of a mistake, but at the same time, I'm winning and I'm willing to slip up a little bit now that I'm on the attacking foot. It was also at this point that I decided to go down the British mission tree since we're going to be taking France through this war anyway. I probably don't have to worry about the Angevin missions, and the British missions are extremely good, so I'm going for it. Despite France being out of manpower, I'm also out of manpower, and the battles are costing me, but I have an answer up my sleeve. First, I exploit a little bit of manpower development just for a slight boost to numbers. I'm sieging Chartres and I'm low on men, so I don't want to risk getting kicked out of such a long siege. Then I took the army off but kept it close by to limit attrition. I also hunted down whatever small armies were around that I could kill with minimal losses. I then won the siege of Chartres, leaving Paris open to me. Oh, and I made peace with Scotland at this point, since their ally of Utrecht had 7,000 troops annoying me in France. Now I've got them as a vassal, and I took their money to support the war effort. Anyway, the trick up my sleeve for this war was Military Tech 4. I got it in July of 1451, which means that after 7 years of war, I now have a truly distinct advantage over this weakened France. I also finished sieging Paris at the same time, which means this war is basically over. You just have to hold Paris and wait for the ticking war score, and France's war exhaustion day at high enough levels for peace. I had a somewhat shaky battle in Orleans in the Battle of 1452, which was extremely costly and unnecessary. I engaged the French vassals and the papal army, followed by French reinforcements in an extremely costly battle. It looked like I could win, but the reinforcements just kept coming and I did lose the battle. With zero manpower, this loss hurt. I was also scared of a stack wipe so I retreated to Alençon. I did escape to Caux before anything horrible happened, but it almost looked like France could turn this around. Had I not taken that awful battle, I likely wouldn't have needed to do this, but I chose to hire another mercenary company, which is expensive, but worthwhile for this union. Thankfully, the Pope sent me a white piece, which does hurt France's numbers significantly. Without the Pope and his vassals to help, I was able to wipe out the small armies in Normandy, and then I moved into Chartres in Paris. Given that I'm over my force limit due to the new mercenaries, I consolidated my manpower armies, reducing my troop count, and then headed into Paris. Now we've got the scales back in our favor, and France is surely done for this time. From here, I sieged my way south until France finally gave in after 9 years of protracted war. Taking 460 ducats of cash and forcing a union, I have defeated France in the Hundred Years' War all without releasing Normandy or Gascony, as many of you complained about in my last England playthrough. So that's England's opening. We're already now one of the strongest nations, if not the strongest nation in all of Europe. We've got lots of money and mercenaries to win our wars. Let's take a where to go next. If you're trying to learn how to make money, it's pretty easy as England given that you've got control over much of the English Channel. Just focus on moving money into the English Channel. We're going to take the coming of the European Coalition as an opportunity to focus in on the economy. As far as I'm concerned, these European nations should mind their business and not snoop into my affairs as England. Who I conquer and who I subjugate is my own private information. Perhaps if the King of England had NordVPN, he'd have been able to keep his aggressive expansion lower. 
Of course, you'd have to explain to him that a VPN is a virtual private network, to which he might burn you as a witch, but assuming you work your way through to him, you could convince him that his messenger pigeons need some kind of cipher to keep their messages safe. This is exactly what NordVPN does for you by hiding your IP address and routing all your data through Nord's thousands of servers across the world. These days, even Linus tech tips can get hacked by email scams, and if a technical wizard like him can be affected, so can you. NordVPN protects you from phishing scams using its threat protection program, which also protects you from malicious advertisements, or malvertising. Anyone can be at risk of losing their passwords to shady sites, or contracting a dangerous virus on their computer, and the consequences can be horrific. That aside, even the stress of knowing it could happen to you is enough to cause problems for many people. So set aside those worries and let Nord handle your online security. If security is not your thing, you can also consider NordVPN to get around region locking on sites like Netflix or other streaming sites. All you have to do is pick a server in another country and voila. If NordVPN were in EU4, then you wouldn't have to worry about aggressive expansion, espionage actions, or any of those icky modifiers that a powerful spy network puts you through. It's truly sad that Nord wasn't around in the Renaissance. Thank goodness you can go into the description or the pinned comment, click my link, or use promo code TARKISNORD to get a 4 month extra on top of the 2 year plan when you sign up. You'll be supporting me and getting yourself a service that keeps you safe. Thank you. Back to the game. So, with all that conquest, we've got a coalition brewing, and that means we can focus on our internal politics now. We've got a special privilege on our nobility as England, which is the villainage. This is basically a tax reduction and influence inflating privilege that we want to get rid of as soon as possible. First off, let's just get rid of the mercenary companies out of manpower. It's useless now, and we won't be at war for a while. I'm replacing them with the Flemish company only because I don't want the coalition to declare war on me. The more powerful my army, the less likely a coalition is to declare war on me. My focus in this period of the run is going to be on the estates, and I'm getting my subjects loyal. There isn't much nuance to this, as all you do is improve relations. One thing which can be overlooked is the importance of trading favors with subjects for trust. Trust will reduce liberty desire by quite a bit, and you can't use favors with subjects anyway, so you might as well. I'm also going to try and pick permanent issues I like. For example, I got a permanent issue that grants me 5% crown land. Since I want to get rid of villainage, this is a great option for me to pick, but you might also be interested in the ones that grant government reform progress or manpower. The coalition definitely sucks because I got an opportunity to attack Provence, who was excommunicated, but they're in a coalition. In theory, if you're a super giga chad, you can go conquering off in random directions as you see fit, but as I've mentioned before, this isn't going to be a super hardcore guide, more just a basic guide for getting England to a powerful position by the Age of Reformation. Another thing I haven't mentioned yet is my alliance with Burgundy. See, we used it to help us beat France, but we're sticking with Burgundy because we can still get the Burgundian inheritance, which, if we do, we will basically never have to worry about any wars or collisions again. And once we integrate Burgundy, we'll have full control of the English Channel. That being said, the Burgundian inheritance is tricky, and also luck-based. If you're willing to, you can always save scum every failed inheritance till you get it, but also you don't need to since you can claim the throne manually as well if you just stick with them and put heirs in their throne. Anyway, I kept doing estate missions and revoking land until I was able to abolish Villainage in July of 458. This isn't a huge turning point for the nation, but it's certainly quite useful and it lets us progress the mission tree more. A few months later in September, I used loyalists to get France loyal, and eventually as their opinion improves, I won't even need to use loyalists anymore. We're nice and secure, with both Scotland and France loyal, and allies in Castile and Burgundy to keep us safe. While all this is going on, I've been using my diplomats to improve relations with nations that are on the cusp of the coalition. Generally speaking, once an outraged nation hits about 50 opinion of you, they will leave the coalition. Some nations will have way too much aggressive expansion to possibly hit that threshold, but many nations of the exterior of the coalition can be improved to 50. The more you do this, the more the coalition shrinks. Eventually, if it shrinks enough, it might disband, since weak coalitions will eventually stop trying. I still have an economic deficit, but it's nothing serious, and I can sell more crown land now that Villainage is gone without worrying about having too low of a share to get rid of it. I've got a nice mad power pool, a third of the crown land, and enough ducats to maintain my deficit for many years. It's about time that we get back to war. Brittany is right on the cusp of the coalition, and by improving relations, they will leave the coalition. Meanwhile, I'll be fabricating on them. I got my first idea group at this point, and as England, there are tons of options. You could go colonial with expansion ideas or exploration ideas. You could go trade ideas for huge money. You could do quantity to field a massive army, although I feel my economy is too weak to make that work currently. You could even play tall with infrastructure or economic. I'm going with offensive in this case. I want to siege faster and get better generals. I like the policies this idea group comes with, and I fully intend to keep conquering stuff this run. By 1463, the coalition is basically gone, and I'm ready to resume my conquests. I want a few more claims on Brittany, and then they'll be my new target. Before them, though, I'm going to conquer Ireland. They're an easy target, and I've got excess manpower now that it may well as go somewhere. That being said, I still chose to use my mercenaries for that war, because my regular army was drilling in London this whole time, and I want professionalism. I forgot to mention that I've been drilling this whole peace period. 
One of the Irish stations was allied to the Isles, so I gave Scotland's cores back to them by making a separate peace with them, which finished my conquest of Scotland mission tree-wise. Ireland was a breeze to conquer, and now I can do the Ireland Parliament issue. It is always best to release Ireland as a personal union since it means you don't have to core the land, and you get a permanent modifier from it which gives prestige and reduced unjustified demands cost. It even gives you a diplomatic relations slot which stays up to integrate Ireland. It's also just fun to see Ireland exist since it's a rare tag. This is basically all for the internal affairs section, and now we move on to our next round of conquest. I have some plans for this run, and they involve war with Denmark. We're going to revive the North Sea Empire before the Age of Reformation. Oh, final note, I conquered Brittany without any real opposition and cored them myself. Now moving on. Here's my England in 1469. We've got France and all the British Isles with strong alliances and potential for a Burgundian inheritance. All we lack is money, and the answer to that issue is Lubick. This trade note feeds directly into the English Channel and is quite rich. It's also mostly held by a relatively weak nation, Denmark. Let me be clear, Denmark is not a total pushover, but there's certainly no Austria or Poland Lithuania. Neutering Denmark is pretty easy with just one or two wars, but we need a particular splendor ability first. I want to get the one that lets me transfer subjects for half the cost, and that's because most of Denmark's power comes from their control over Sweden and Norway. I have the navy to defeat them. I just need the right way to weaken them without losing the opportunity to snatch away Sweden and Norway. That's how we'll do it. I was involved in a war against Granada as Castile's ally, and nothing interesting happened, so I skipped over it. I sent some troops down to help just because I was thinking maybe I could serve peace for a piece of Morocco, but my coring range wasn't far enough, unfortunately. Anyway, we have claims to Norway's island in the Atlantic, which we could use to fight Denmark. The nice thing about making Orkney the war goal is that it'll be really easy to occupy. I'm going to call in Burgundy to help just because it'll make the war even easier, although I'm not too worried about this war. Burgundy will handle the allies in the Holy Roman Empire, and I'll go out to Denmark proper. I immediately sent my army to Sealand via boat, and promptly got stack wiped. Ouch. If this happens to you, you may want to consider quitting the game and never coming back, but I'm shameless, so I just sent my boats home, reminded myself that overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer, and then rebuilt the army to try again but more intelligently. I gave Burgundy whatever land they wanted in separate peace deals, because in my mind I'll be putting them in a union in the future, so any land they take is land for me. Whether that happens or not, I'm also happy to just strengthen my sworn ally. Rather than foolhardily landing in Sea Island, I'm just going to let France and Burgundy work their way through schleswig holstein while I occupy the Straits to give them access. Yes, this is much wiser. The Hanseatic Republic of Lubeck was in this war, and seeing that normally this nation would be a difficult to attack HRE member, I chose to repeat them for Lubeck, the city itself. This city is great for control over the Lubeck trade node, and I'm not too worried about the aggressive expansion. That'll resolve itself eventually. Once Burgundy was sieging down Kolding, I sent my army to Finn to occupy it, and thus blocked Denmark's access to the western half of their country. I was considering taking Dithmarschen as another city to control trade with, but the aggressive expansion would have been a bit much when combined with Lubeck, so I let it go. I lost a battle in Lolland to the Kalmar forces, but it didn't get stack wiped, so my pride is intact. Then I lost another battle in Lolland, but whatever. It doesn't matter, since I just need Kolding to fall so my allies and subjects can flood into Denmark. They promptly did so. And then Denmark got a PU on the Palatinate. Now, if I were a crazy man, I'd consider transferring the Palatinate to myself as a vassal at this moment, but I'm not interested in imperial politics, so I let it go. Don't worry about the war with Venice, by the way, that's just Austria calling me in for a war they have no chance of losing for some reason. With Denmark overrun, I made a treaty in 1480 where all I did was transfer Sweden. Now this is where I learned something new. Sweden's modifiers that give them huge liberty desire against Denmark? Yeah, they stay against whatever new nation takes them over. I've now got a horrifically disloyal Sweden with no Danish flavor events to reduce it. This is fine, I will work them down, but man, 75% extra liberty desire will take some work. Regardless, we've definitely hurt Denmark by doing this, as they've lost their most powerful subject. I also unlocked my second idea group at this point, uh, and I chose religious ideas. This is because I really like going Anglican, and if you go Anglican with religious ideas, that means you get a Deus Volt CB on literally every nation in the game. Very useful. Even if you don't go Anglican, the CB on any heretic or heathen is just so good, and being able to convert centers of reformation will be useful in case any pop up in my subjects. Castile called me into a war against Aragon, which would have put me in war with Austria, and you know what? I think I don't need Castile anymore. I have almost no aggressive expansion in that region, so why not betray Castile now? Decline on call to arms will reduce my trust in my allies and subjects, but not in any way that I can't fix. I don't plan to mess with Castile yet, but I'll get around to it. Anyway, looking back at the point in this section, controlling Lubeck, I've got a much better economy now with Lubeck in my hands. I can move more money from Denmark into the English Channel, and I can use lightship to strengthen my hold in the node. I make about 5 ducats each month, which is not huge, but keep in mind that previously I was in a deficit. While waiting for my truce with Denmark to expire, I've been fabricating claims so I can take land from them alongside Norway in the next war. Once I take Norway, and a couple provinces of Denmark proper, I'll have basically completely conquered them, 
and I have some ideas for where I can take the campaign after that, which might include some culture shifting shenanigans. We'll have to see since I haven't got any concrete plans, so maybe you've got ideas, dear viewer? Comment below. Using the explorer I got for one of my missions, I sent my fleet off to America. I don't plan to colonize in this run much, but I might as well explore just for the naval tradition. Not much happened until 1494, at which point my Denmark troops expired and another war broke out. This war is, of course, even easier than the last one. It was also at this point that the Burgundian succession happened, but it didn't go my way. Note here about the Burgundian inheritance. If Burgundy is a great power, they are extremely likely to just stay independent, which I knew, but I was hoping I'd get lucky anyway. I did save scum to try and make it happen, but spoiler alert, I didn't get it the second time either. I'm still going to stick with my plan of eventually claiming their throne, we'll just do it manually later. In your game, you might want to hold off on feeding Burgundy too much if you really want the Burgundian inheritance, but it's up to you. So remember when I said that this war would be even easier? Well, there's a complication. Castile allied Denmark. Now, I can definitely beat Castile, but I'm just focusing on Denmark first so I can turn around and get Castile afterwards. This means Castile has been able to completely occupy France, which kind of sucks, but oh well. If anything, as a proud Englishman, my king would be happy to see France ravaged, so... The war dragged on until 1500, and after that much time, Castile just left the war with a white piece. After Castile left, I had almost 90% war score in Denmark, and I was able to end the war. I took Kolding, Finn, and Lolland alongside Norway as my new subject. I'm not sure how it happened, but Navarra got free from Castile, so I vassalized them, and I'm totally going to use Navarra's mission tree to get claims on all of Iberia. It'll just take a little bit to conquer on their behalf to make it happen. I allied with Navarra while they were at war with Castile, so I was able to properly fight the Spaniards this time. It was also at this point that Burgundy once again had their succession, but they just chose independence. This time, I accept the decision. I'm currying favors so I can ask them to put my family on their throne later. The war with Castile was difficult at first, but eventually they collapsed against my power, and Navarra made a solid peace deal that I was happy with. They conquered several provinces for themselves and released Leon. Even with their new provinces, they're still willing to get vassalized, so everything worked out. Unfortunately, Leon would not accept vassalization. Not that it mattered, since Portugal immediately ate them up. That was quite opportunistic for an AI. By the way, I actually managed to get Sweden loyal in 1505 by increasing trust and placating their ruler. I got it below 50%, so now I can annex them, and once I do that, I won't have to worry about that 75% liberty desire. Thank goodness. I hate seeing the disloyal subjects warning and the flags at the top. Oh, when I said Leon got annexed, turns out that's not true. They escaped to South America, so get ready for a Leonese exodus. I'm definitely going to keep my eye on them, and see where they go. Heck, I might even try to vassalize them later so they can colonize for me. The next couple years were uneventful. I'm waiting for truces right now, and I'm just waiting for Sweden to be annexed so I don't have to worry about them. My income is strong, my allies are strong, and in 1513, I got an heir of my dynasty on Burgundy's throne. This was followed by Württemberg founding Protestantism, and the age of discovery reaching its final decade. Alice Burgundy conquered more land in the Empire, and boy, they're getting greedy, taking land in Hanover. Using my new Purge Heresy CB, I declared war on Protestant Denmark, who Castile once again supported. I chose to make Castile break their lines to Denmark, so I have to fight them every time. And against Denmark, I took Skan and the rest of Sjaland, except Bornholm. This would be my last war before the end of the Age of Discovery. I got my third idea group shortly after in 1519, and I picked quality ideas. This is a lazy choice on my part. I just want to win battles effortlessly, and although other idea groups would be simply superior, I like to not have to think too much about battles. More combat ability, more discipline, and more army tradition make winning a simple exercise. Burgundy called me to war with Switzerland, but I didn't bother participating, I just let France handle that, and with that, the Age of Discovery has ended, plunging England into religious chaos. My boy Henry Stuart took the throne of Burgundy, and now it's just a waiting game until I can claim the throne and take Burgundy for myself. Oh, by the way, I didn't notice, but Burgundy became the holder of an emperor. I'm genuinely considering waiting to see if they form Lotharingia and then claiming their throne just so I can have a way cooler tag. We'll see how things turn out. Despite the Age of Discovery ending, I'm pushing through a couple more years because I noticed that Hamburg conquered a huge bit of Denmark, and I want to conquer them before I ever forget to take advantage of Burgundy not defending them. The war was very short, and I annexed Hamburg and all of its stolen Danish territories for myself. At this point, Lubeck is my trade node, and I feel pretty good. Now I'm going to end the video as we look over the glorious empire. I got myself a cute little North Sea Empire here, with the bonus of a French kingdom and a little Navarra down south. I definitely want to continue down the British mission tree before changing tags or anything, but one thing I'll tell you is England did not form Britain. There are nations with better mission trees and ideas that you can form if you're willing to be just a bit patient. I see no real reason to form Britain when I get all the missions whether I form them or not. Tune in next episode to see where we take England, and I hope this video will help you improve your own England playthroughs. Remember that there's never a reason to let France be independent as England. You can always defeat them with just a little work. Work that pays off. Thank you for your time.